welcome, Sarah Brilligan. How are you? Very good. Very good. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. I'm getting a little peek inside your lovely home as we get. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we've finally actually bought some furniture. We just had these vacuous spaces for ages, but we finally bought some furniture. Yeah. So, and this is, I've got a view. I'm sat in a room with daylight, um, which is the only place I can find myself sitting and working. So it's a perfect place to sit and work. It's nice. What a place to work. What a place to work. So we're going to dive right in. We're going to dive right in to, um, you know, the, the business mindset. And I think for anyone for listening to this who is contemplating starting their own business or would like to be an entrepreneur and doesn't know where to start, this is really is going to be an episode for you. Um, but what got you into being uh, the entrepreneur that you are and the success that you are? Where did it all start? So it's a, it's a really good question because, you know, I think you hear so many people's stories and they're like, oh, I was always going to be an entrepreneur. That just wasn't my my story at all. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a working class northern family, uh, mum and dad, mum was a maths teacher, dad, 30 years in the same business, worked sort of middle management. Um, and I grew up in a world where you get a job, you graft, you get a pension, that's it. That's, mm. that's, that's your lot. Um, and during that time growing up, the one thing that was for sure is I was always really interested in business. I didn't know at the time that that's what it was. But I, when I look back, I think I was always fascinated by why do we all have the same brands and why were we eating the same cheese or singing the same adverts from the telly? You know, <laughs> I was fascinated by how these businesses were kind of getting into our head, I guess. Um, and so when it when I came to my choice at university, I wanted to do two things. One, my dad wouldn't let me have a gap year. Um, so I was determined to study abroad. He was like, you've got to go and get yeah. a job. Yeah. Um, so I was determined to go abroad and travel. And the second thing is, is I wanted to do business. I was really interested in this concept of learning about how you get brands into, into houses. So I did international business and Oh, found my thing I loved it hmm. but still at this point I didn't need or want to be an entrepreneur I was just fascinated by business and actually very very lucky reasonably early on found the thing that I love which um, at the time as it happens it, I just love business actually but at the time I found hospitality loved it got into it really enjoyed it and everything that I was doing was all about I wanted to travel still in my 20s, so opening restaurants abroad was something that I was really, really keen to do. And learning, I just wanted to learn, to be honest. Um, And I was surrounded by really great people and found that it was something that I was good at, having not been great at school, to be honest, completely messed up my A-levels. I got C, two Ds and an E for my (laughs) A-levels, but managed to get on the right university course through hustle and chat. Uh, No surprise there. Um, (laughs) And yeah, managed to get my way into the course that I really wanted to get get onto. But but I just surrounded myself with great people and learned during my 20s. So it wasn't until my late 20s that I suddenly thought, hang on a second, had this sort of big moment of realization where I realized that actually the, the thing that was most important to me was my life, me, not my work, and all of that was me, and and my time. And I suddenly realized that I actually had very little control of my time. I was in different country, often three times in a week, um, all over the place. And whilst I'd loved it for that period of my of my life, I was in sort of my mid to late twenties and thought, you know, I really want to be a mom hadn't yet met Michael, my husband, want to be a mom, very, very important to me, Um, wanted a big family. And when I envisaged this next stage of my life, which I hoped would happen, um, very lucky it did happen, uh, which I'd hoped would happen, I thought, there's not a chance it's going to happen if I continue to live the way Mm -hmm. that I'm living. So, and I'm, I've always been a very big believer that, that your, 
you you start off with your life path and your work has got to fall into place. Like there is, I don't believe in career paths and you'll never hear me talk about a career path. Um, It's always about which direction is my life going in at the moment. And that's when I thought it's not what I want in my life. I want to be the person that decides what's going into my diary at 10 o'clock on a Monday morning or at four o'clock on a Thursday. I I need to be Mm. that person. And thinking about it, I thought, well, the only way I can do this actually is if I become the entrepreneur. And actually it's taken me years to to say I am an entrepreneur because (laughs) for years I always thought, well, I'm not an entrepreneur because actually I don't create anything from scratch. Um, So I thought I, I, I'm going to go alone. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go off and I'm going to do this myself. And I was sat at my desk at Pizza Express at the time thinking, right, (laughs) you know, I, I need a plan. And I, that's when I looked around and thought, well, Indian restaurants are really popular at the time. There were 10,000 in the UK, lots of sort of mom and pop set up, but nobody had actually created a chain. And I had been lucky enough to spend the last year of my time at Pizza Express sharing an office with the chief executive and the MD. And uh, I, I was working for the board at the time on sort of special projects, really. And I had almost sucked them dry of everything, got all of their knowledge. I must have been a nightmare when I look back at it. I asked every single question more and more and more. I wanted to understand how have you created value here? What have you done to create shareholder value? Why are you making all the decisions that you're making? Why why is it structured in the way that it's structured financially? Why do we borrow here? Why have we got equity there? The whole thing. And by the end of it, having had these... Um, guys on pedestals thinking they're amazing I got to the end of the year and thought oh my god I actually really understand what you do I get it and that was the real moment where I thought actually that coupled with this big kind of life decision um, I thought I can I've got this I can do it and as in any decision I've ever made in my life, I look at, well, what's my downside? Um, Can I handle my downside? And in this case, my downside was that I failed. Well, I can definitely handle that. Possibly dent my ego and reputation a bit. Definitely can handle that. Mm. That's not going to do any harm. And am I going to lose any, am I going to lose the roof over my head? Well, I didn't really have one at the time. You know, I was in my twenties. What, what really am I going to lose? Um, right, do it. And worst case scenario, it all goes completely wrong. And I go and get a job because actually I worked hard and done some good stuff in my twenties anyway. So that was really, that's the, why the entrepreneur was, was, was that I was driven by desperately wanting to own my time. And that's been a very, very strong driving force throughout my whole life, actually was is this almost this freedom of, of owning your own time and that's still right still today is what is what drives me I love that answer and it's it, it is quite evident I, I think in your life that you uh even just doing some research on you today even though I know you I, you know you, I, I was doing some research and it, everything that I came across was you talking about your family and your goal to have this big family but more importantly it was to be there for your family and just to hear you say that's your big why is yeah pretty amazing yeah it's been um it's been very so i'm a i'm a believer a fundamental believer that you can't fight nature Hmm. um nature will always win in in every aspect i think you you can't you can't beat it. So, the, and that's, I think it's where a lot of businesses go wrong, actually, where they don't go with somebody's natural, in somebody's natural direction or where people go wrong because they pick businesses that are not natural fit for them. Um, and, and so for me, because I had this overwhelming desire to be a mom and needed to nurture, that was really, really important to me to be there as a mom. And um, you know, would mess with my head basically if I if I couldn't, you know, if my child was ill and 
and I couldn't take them to the doctors, let's say, or whatever it might be, but somebody else governed um, the sort of makeup of my day and my week. So that that drive, that natural drive, I never wanted to try and fight. I wanted to go with that. But So therefore, knowing that and knowing the power of it, I always knew that actually what I had to do was find a career, a work, something that would pay for all of this. And actually, mm-hmm. I love it. You know, I like getting my brain cells going. I like being Sarah Willingham, you know, not a mom, not a wife, not a, but just I like that. I love it. Um, this, I needed that bit needed to fall into place to help power the ability to be the mom. And I think it's a balance, right? It's always a balance. And and what I've just said there will resonate with some people and not with others. You know, I've got friends who um, had children, could not wait to get back to work. And there's, you know, that's equally as great. There's nothing, yeah. that's them also recognizing that that's them, that's, their nature that's what they need to do and in fact they didn't really kick in until the kids were a bit older and um and now it now they have a very different relationship with their children and and they just didn't it wasn't natural for them early on um so you have to you have to find the bit that works with you but I think the most important thing is wherever you can is to be true to who you are like what is to understand what it is that drives you because if you try and fight nature i just i just believe sincerely that you will lose i'm absolutely with you on that but we'll have a good old go won't we <laughs> <laughs> always <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> i want to touch upon you talked about you were weighing up the risks and you know so you went through a list of things which could have gone wrong with the Bombay Bicycle Club if, if it didn't take off etc and um, what I'm interested in is there was a confidence there around well if you know my, I might dent my ego well do you know what I'll, I'll deal with that it was almost kind of so what where has that come from so hmm. It's a good question. I've actually been asked that a similar, like that it's, it's a question that I get asked, I guess a lot is how do you get that confidence if you don't have it? And I've always been, so risk is something that I think we don't talk about enough. And I think confidence, if you don't feel it in your tummy, you can actually work with it in your head. So I think if, it, if it's not natural to you, you know, as we've just talked about, I think you, I think you can educate yourself. I think you can, you can make a list, pros and cons, if, you're, if it's not intuitive mm. to you. And I think, you know, firstly, nobody wants their legacy to be the person that came up with the, with the idea that, and never did anything about it, right? Like, don't be that person that spend, oh, I've, great idea something I've always wanted to do and you actually never take action I'm a I'm I'm a doer and a person that believes in doing and trying and failing Mm. doing and trying and succeeding doing and trying and failing you know that's okay it's okay to fail it doesn't matter actually and it's coming back to that well what's the worst thing that can happen here now you know don't risk the roof over your head don't miss risk your health don't risk your family don't risk the things that, that you you're not you can't you can't handle that downside. If you can't handle the downside, do not do it. Absolutely don't do it. But then what is your downside? Your downside is you fail and we'll get back up again and do something else Mm. until you don't fail. Um, You know, now a lot of people will say, okay, then in, in failing, I've, I've got a life I need to pay for. So often, I think so people will have like action paralysis is is yeah. definitely a thing and that's the that's that risk of my god I've been thinking about this thing for so long now I I daren't do it because what if it isn't everything that I want it to be and I can tell you it won't be everything you want it to be it never is but that's okay give it a go and in fact usually you find the path 
within it. It's never what you planned it to be in the first place. So that's okay. So don't worry about that. Financially is always the big one, really, because, well, can I afford... Can I afford to take this risk? So I'm not talking about necessarily spending money to do it. I'm talking about often giving up, let's say, an income to be able to do something. So that's different. And that that has to be weighed out. And normally, depending on whatever the business plan is, I often try and recommend running the two paths together at the same time until it becomes obvious that there is a tipping point here where you can go, okay, now I will go over to this. Now I will start my business and, and, and make it work. Um, but the, the decision paralysis, which you see a lot, that action, that actually doing it comes so often from that fear of it not being what you anticipated, not being what you need it to be and want it to be, what you've promised yourself it's going to be. Um, and that is you have to just sit there and write your pros and your cons and what is my absolute downside here and you just have to do it and unfortunately we cannot make progress in life unless we do something unless we change something unless Mm. it it actually happens talking ain't going to change anything so you've got to do it and I think I'm for me I'm lucky that's that's in me. It's natural. I'm a doer. I'm a mover. You know, I'm always going yeah. forwards all the time. And I appreciate and, and value, you know, I'm lucky. I know that. Uh, but I do think, and I've worked with enough people now and spent enough time talking to people now that it is something that if it's not in you, you can learn. And I think you can work with very good people. I think you can work with great coaches Um, I think you can work with people that can help you Mm. to get over that hurdle of making that decision. But, but whatever it is, you, you can't, your legacy can't be that you came up with a great idea and never did it. Like you, it can't be, you can't look back in 10 years time. And I mean, what the, the, what's the Mark, Mark Twain quote, you never regret the things you did do. You only ever regret the things you didn't. I love that. You know, let that not be what's you know what you carry through into your old age yeah and you know what other i mean i mean obviously you you sound like you're you're a doer you've got this natural confidence you're a mover but what obstacles have you faced in regards to maybe your mindset and how did you overcome anything that you know was holding you back yeah i um i think imposter syndrome is was a huge thing for me for a long, long time. Um, And again, that, that became a real mindset thing for me where I had to really talk myself through it and say, you know, you, this needs to be a superpower, Sarah, not, not a fear. It's not Uh. something that's stopping you doing something. And I actually had a real um, kind of life changing moment where um, I walked into a, it was it was in my late twenties. I walked into a meeting. Um, we were I was at Pizza Express at the time, and I was working for the board on projects. And we were buying Ketners in Soho, and I was in charge of the project. And I I walked into the meeting. I was just a couple of minutes late, and on the opposite side of the room was the lawyers and the team for Ketners. And on my side of the table, there was my lawyers and there was a space for me to sit down. And as I walked in, the lawyer on the opposite side of the table hardly even looked up and said, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, mine's white with mine's white with one sugar as I walked into the meeting room. What? And I, um, I re- it was such a powerful moment. And I sort of put my bag down and I remember taking a breath and thinking, you know, this this had been the story of my twenties, mm-hmm. like absolutely the story of my twenties. And I put my bag down and went walked around to the coffee machine and made it was a filter coffee thing and poured him a coffee and said, "Would anybody else like one while I'm here?" Um, nobody else breathed because I think the entire <laughs> room realised what he'd done. Yeah, uh, he still hadn't looked up. Okay, um, and I took it round and put it in front of him and then made myself a coffee and then sat down and looked up at him and said um should we start the meeting now 
And I sat back in my chair and watched the colour drain from this guy's face. And the meeting then completely went in my direction. Everything I wanted out of that meeting happened. And it was such a powerful moment for me where something that had... And it still... I didn't get that. it, It didn't disappear of course it doesn't disappear overnight so imposter syndrome has been a thing you know for years but it was a real life-changing moment where I realized that okay it might be natural for me to feel imposter syndrome but I can absolutely work my mindset on this and I can work my way through it and I walked out of there realizing that actually it had been my superpower in that meeting that he had underestimated me and I then carried that with me for years and years and years. And I always have this thing, my team always laugh at me. I always have this thing that before any meeting, I always put, I've always got a lip gloss. Before <laughs> any meeting, I always put extra lip gloss on. And it's what I'd done in that meeting. And it's almost like this powerful thing where I, I go, you know, I think to myself, you know, people don't see the rhino coming, right? You know, the, it's, the, it's the big, huge animal in the savannah with the little legs and you think, what the hell's that going to do? And nobody ever <laughs> sees it coming. And actually, it's the biggest killer in the savannah. Um, and I think that's so often how, certainly me growing up really in the 90s, certainly how women were perceived, and sadly still are actually in a lot. It, it hasn't progressed anywhere near as much as I would have liked it to have done. And we would have liked it to have done. Um, but that imposter syndrome and that being underestimated, um, I realized was a superpower that in fact, Mm. again, you know, when something is a weakness, you have to learn to turn it into a strength. You have to learn to work with it. I mean, even last week, right. I I was supposed to go for lunch with a friend, uh, with work. And he messaged me first saying, Oh, uh, don't meet. We were supposed to be going to Tonkotsu. He said, don't meet me. Tonkotsu at 12, 12.30, meet me at the Savoy. We're going to abseil off the Savoy. I was like, no, we're not. Don't be stupid. Of course we're not going to abseil. I'm like 50. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, and I got there and I thought, I'll oh, just watch him. Abse-. He's like, no, 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 no. You're signed up. Like, it's for charity. You've got to do it now. And it's a bit like, it, that's my mindset is I would rather face the fear of doing it mm go through that experience of it being like really thinking, oh my God, what the hell am I doing? Then walk away because of the fear. I'd rather talk myself through it and do it than not. And I think that's the same when I've come across these stump, these, I guess, psychological issues where, for example, it is like imposter syndrome you if it's stopping you do doing something or it's you know it's affecting your judgment or affecting your behavior or affecting the outcome basically then what can I do to change it and that's what I I'm very conscious of always trying to work with those things that are holding me back actually yeah you know you gave me goosebumps when you said that um imposter syndrome is a superpower because I, as something that I promote quite a lot, but but people look at me very strangely when I say that, when I say how it's such a gift, I love imposter syndrome, you know, and I did a, I talked to a a podcast group about it and they were looking at me, you know, as if to say what, but it's that thing of imposter syndrome is a reminder. It's a way of going, Oh, there's something within me that needs addressing. Because if I don't address this imposter syndrome, then I'm going to be held back. And if I work with it and turn it into something positive, it's going to lead me forward. Yeah. Yeah, uh, completely. And and I think I agree with that. I also think there's nothing wrong with, you know, there's nothing wrong with keeping your feet on the ground, right? Mm. Like keeping the, almost keeping that level of, of, of reality as well of and perspective i think is really important um in anything that you do is is keeping perspective that like you know what's it all really about um but yeah to me i things like that have i've learned that's my superpower Mm. you know what underestimate me that's that's 
it only works in my favor because that's what happened in that meeting. I walked out with the deal. I think that's fantastic. You know? <laughs> and, and I have to love that. And, and, and if someone is listening to this and thinking, okay, but I'm still not to do with, I, don't, I still know what to do with my imposter syndrome, or I'm too frightened to move forward because who am I to be an entrepreneur? I know you, you made me laugh earlier when you talked about, you know, you didn't see yourself as an entrepreneur because I was sat in a meeting not long ago thinking they were saying, Paul, you're an entrepreneur. And I was thinking, am I really though? Yeah, you know, it's, that's, really I've though? heard that for years. Yeah, yeah totally. I've only just recently, I mean, it's, it's like literally the last few years yeah. I've gone, yeah, okay. Okay, it, fine. We'll it, do it's, this. A, it's a weird sort of thing to settle into. But if there's someone listening to this thinking, this all sounds great, but I'd love to be an entrepreneur. I'd love to be as successful as uh, Sarah Willingham. But I, I don't know how to do forward. What would you, what would you advise? You know, so being held back. Well, firstly, you've got to find out what's stopping you. Mm. Like, honestly, what's stopping you. And I think if you can't be honest with yourself, then it is worth actually finding somebody that you can talk to that will be honest with you, that will ask you those difficult questions and see through some of the nonsense. I think that's that's important to, or to help you see through mm. some of the nonsense. Um, and whether or not that's a good friend, whether or not that's a coach, whether or not that's somebody else in business, whatever. I certainly have found that over over the years, more doors are open than shut. So, you know, find somebody and keep knocking on a door until you find the, the, the right person. And you'll know you'll know when you find the right person because that person will start to unlock things in your, in your, mm. in your mind, I think. So, yeah, I think um, find out what it is that's stopping you in the first place and, and, and being really honest. And, you know, it might be that it is something really practical like money, in which case yeah. it is a practical conversation about inflows and outflows in your life and how else you can side hustles and how else you can you can make that work that's that's one side or it could actually be fear of failure and in which case it's it's okay what what so why mm. why why are you why are you scared of, of failing and well i don't want to i don't want to look stupid but why not well, because everybody will laugh at me, but so wh why is that a problem? What, yeah. what, who, who's going to laugh at you? Well, my friends, really? Like, are your friends really going to laugh at you because <laughs> you fail? Or do you mean lots of people you don't know? Like, you, yeah. and actually you'd be surprised. Far fewer people care about you than you think they do actually. <laughs> in the, <laughs> uh, you know, in, and I mean that in the nicest possible yeah, way, yeah. but... Like what? No, they probably they probably don't give a monkeys to be perfectly honest. Um, so it's that it's that mm. challenge of why, why, why? You know what's what's happening here. Um, but I think if you if you if you can't do it to yourself, the most important thing first of all is to find the person who will yeah. help you. Almost almost like a list, actually. Yeah, I I, I absolutely agree with you. And um, going back to that you know why i asked you earlier uh we talked just before we we came on online what was the one question that you wished other people would more people would ask you but they don't and your answer was it why yeah <laughs> there you go yeah it's definitely the question i think over my life that mm. um i mean i ask it like ruthlessly to myself now yeah. ruthlessly um, and I say ruthlessly because sometimes it's brutal, oh. but, you know, that I force myself to answer that question. Um, but I definitely wish that over the, I think it would have been very helpful and I would have got to my level of self-awareness and understanding a lot sooner had, had my decisions been questioned. Why, what is it that is driving you, Sarah? Why, mm. why do you want this life? Why do you want to do that? Why do you, why are you saying no to that? Why are you saying yes to that? Why are you do? why are you going left when everybody else is going right? Why, 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 why? And I think when you, because when you understand the why, you've got a lot stronger chance of being successful because really that's what drives you. So my, my determination 
to be an entrepreneur and to be successful, in inverted yep. commas, and I, and I, I say in inverted commas because my definition of success is not your definition of success, is not mm. somebody else's definition of su- success. Um, so, my, you know, what does success look like to me? Why am I doing it? What's driving me? And for me, it was that freedom. It was the it was the need to govern my my diary. But like everything else in life, I you know, if you're going to do it, I believe do it well. You yeah. know, and it, you know that because we we go to the gym together, right? Mm. Well, you don't turn up and walk around and do nothing. When you <laughs> you turn up, you give it everything, you leave, yeah, you've yeah. done it. But you give it everything, right? And I I really believe that in in whatever I do. Why would I waste my time coming back to this thing that the most important thing I have, the most important thing is my time. So yeah. I am going to be ruthless with it. And when I do something, I'm going to make sure that I I do it well and so that's why the why would have been <laughs> extremely useful yeah, yeah. you know probably in my 20s and and maybe even in my 30s I'm probably you know I've probably cracked that bit now um but yeah when I was when I was younger I think I probably could have understood myself quicker sooner sooner yeah it's such an empowerful question do you have a process do you start off with like, uh, why do I want to, you know, do this new business venture? And then do you then come up with, uh, well, that's an answer. And then does it go down a level and down a level? How does it work for you? No, it's not. It's not as systematic mm-hmm. as that, because I'm a bit more random in my processing, I think. Um, but it is, it's definitely a, a constant challenge of, of, so it's it's an interesting thing because I say no to more than I say yes to, and it's often because of the why. Okay. So um, I'll give you, I guess, a perfect example. Uh, well, I think it's a perfect example. So I used to do this thing. I don't do it anymore because it's, it's more intuitive, but it's, I found this very, very useful tool. Um, Michael and I used to do it at the beginning of every year. We used to start off... Um, and this helps, I think this helps to answer the question of the, the, the process of which we go through mm. and as we make decisions, you know, a sort of decision-making tree, really. Beginning of every year, we used to start off with a, uh, a, a pie, like a circle, like a pie chart. And it makes it sound really boring. We're not, I promise, but this, <laughs> this is the excitement of being married to me. Hooray! <laughs> yeah, pie chart. <laughs> <laughs> How much fun is our January? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, um, we, we don't do any more, but we used okay. to, it was actually genuinely oh, very, very okay. useful. So we start with this pie chart and we, we go, right, what do we want this year to look like? Like in okay. terms of our time. Hmm. And this pie chart represents the finite, it's a year of time. And so we start, well, right, well, I want to travel. So you block off, I don't know, let's say, uh, I don't know, 80 degrees of it. Um, I want to, my kids were young. I want to spend majority of my time being a mom. So that's like 180, not sleep time, everything else, 180, let's say. Um, I need to get fit. I've just had four babies in four years and I'm a mess. I need to get fit and get back in shape. So exercise needs to be a big thing. And it's also very, very important for my head. Exercise, blah, 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 blah. Holidays, see my friends, see my parents, whatever it might be. And then you go, mm. oh, right, yes, well, clearly need to pay for all of this and forgot work. So you you realize that you've got to spend some time working. So work sort of comes out. And But as you put that in and you decide that work's going to be this proportion of it, let's say, you go, well, what am I prepared to compromise? So a little bit has to come off the being a mom bit, Mm-hmm. But you're like, well, that can't go too much this way because that that won't work for me. So I'm not. So then a little bit, you go, well, can some Sam, can some come off exercise? Mm, not at the moment because I've just had four babies and I can't that I can't compromise. Okay, maybe travel a little bit, bit less on friends. And you, what happens in the process of doing this this pie chart is that every decision that you make has a relativity to it. Mm. And you realize True. the visual um, decision of the compromise. You, you, you see it visually. 
the compromise. So as you then, of course, go through the course of the year and you actually realise, oh my God, I'm spending 80% of my time working, you, you know, because you've got this picture in your head of what the pie chart looked like, you know full well you cannot possibly for, be fulfilling the rest of the time that you wanted to spend being a mom or being a friend or traveling or exercise or whatever it might be. So one year we did it and it was, I think it was 2016. And I, at the time was doing quite a lot of TV and I had a regular on Sky, a regular on ITV this morning, a regular radio show on LBC. I was doing loads of TV actually. Um, and as I did my pie chart and worked it, I, I was like, what am I doing? What, why am I doing all of this media? Why? And it had been a plan the year before to do more actually to sort of, because we'd started a business and we were, it was a business that didn't go particularly well. Um, and it was, it, it was supposed to help with the brand of that business. This is a while back. And when I looked at my pie chart, I was like, why am I doing this? So what ended up happening in the process of doing the pie chart is that media and TV I had to be very honest with myself. Why am I doing it? I couldn't think of a good reason. I had to go. So wow. after that, within four weeks, I had resigned, for want of a better word, but given up. Um, I'd been working with an agent at the time, gave notice to my agent, Sky, ITV this morning, stopped everything, absolutely everything. I don't need this or want it in my life. I can't, whilst it's a nice to have, when I looked at the compromise that, that it was gonna take away from the important things, the more important things in my life, I wasn't prepared to do it. So that all went. Of course, then what happens? I mean, I actually, I'm not joking. This is the, the universe was conspiring. I literally had my last call was um, the night before I'd spoken to, a. We had, I was on Sky with Eamon Holmes and I'd phoned Eamon and said, look, I really loved it, blah, blah, blah but I'm not going to do it anymore. And then I'd spoken to the producer and the following morning I had an email in my inbox. I kid you not, I had actually, that was my final, final goodbye to TV. The following morning I had an email in my inbox asking me whether or not I'd come and try out for Dragon's Den. <laughs> and I was like, what? That can't be right. And I remember, I remember kind of closing my laptop and opening it thinking, I can't unsee that. Like I've just spent the last four weeks removing mm. media from my life. And, and actually Dragon's Den, one of the things that was, was on our pie chart was working with other businesses, more okay. investments, all of that. Yeah, and yeah. in fact, Dragon's Den was too big, too much fun. And I never thought I'd get it anyway. Um, so I was like, yes, of course I'll come for the screen test. What a laugh, I'll meet Deborah Mead and then maybe we'll yeah. be friends. Um, not thinking it would turn into something as big as it did end up, end up turning into. But that was, that's a long way of answering the question about the pie chart because yeah. it explains ha the mindset of, of how I'd make the decisions of, of what I was going to do. And I had to be very honest with myself, brutally honest with myself. Why are you doing the TV? And actually, is it really just an ego thing? Like, is it, do, am I doing it because it just makes me feel good? And I think, oh, that's nice. But why am I really doing it? Like it didn't, it, I didn't, there was no real benefit to it for me. Um, and that kind of being that honest with myself and asking the why, 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 why until I got a satisfactory answer meant that I decided not to do any more. I love that. I, I was wondering as well, you know, when you said that you, you began to just re, you know, reassess your media sort of uh, relationship and then ended up on Dragon's Den. I was thinking, how did that work? Uh, but then I, I understand that one. Yeah, you know. yeah, but there was a flexibility, I guess. It's that uh, you knew that it would also bring you more away of opportunities because of the networking side of things. So I guess it, even though you might have to yeah. really cut things down, I guess you might have to hold things a little loosely at times and be flexible. Oh, I mean, everything's so mm. fluid. And in fact, we often reflect on the year gone. And of course you never, ever, I mean, you don't stick to it. Like, you, but it's a guide. It's more of a, 
rather than it being the reality or what you should be doing or it, or mm. you don't hold yourself to it what you 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 do it as a reminder to where your priorities lie you to remind yourself because i think it's very easy but i'm a real adrenaline junkie and i mean i literally hit adrenaline it's like being hooked up i i feel so you know i'm i'm it, it wakes me up mm. i feel confident strong great actually and i i mean i've you know it, it, i've i've had long periods of my time without adrenaline in my system and actually prefer my brain when i don't have all the adrenaline in my system but i'm aware that the world we live in especially in northern europe is is adrenaline filled mm. and it's easy once you get that adrenaline fill to forget the softer things that actually you you really value when you take the time and you're slower and you reflect and mm. you are present and aware and sometimes you have to keep revisiting in a in that in the cold light of day when you are having a reflective moment and you draw for example a pie chart or whatever you don't have to draw a pie chart but go this is important to me mm. um i just think it's very 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 easy to to keep going down that adrenaline filled busy distracted crazy life that we live in right and for me, it always was there as a reminder that, well, all of this time, you know, I want to be at home with my kids and I want to be slower and I want to be present and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. whilst you don't stick to it, it's it's a sense check, right? Yeah, I think I, what I'm really hearing as part of this whole conversation is how, I, I don't even know if you really realize you're doing this and maybe you do you're really connecting with your a future version of you who's living the life that you really want to live so you you imagined yourself as this mom with this big family and then that seemed to create you know a ripple back in time to these are the decisions i'm going to make these are the values i need to you know this is who i need to become to reach that ideal person and just listening to you just then about your your you know your pie chart was you seem to connect very easily to a future version of you who has what you want and is doing what you want. And then you seem to do make those changes back in the here in the present moment. Is that something you recognize or is just something that I was listening to and it's something that I like to talk about with, yeah, with so, clients and things? Yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting reflection. Mm. So one of the things that I, you know, I, I took, I became quite conscious, I think, that I probably spent too much time thinking about that rather than the present. Okay. okay. Um, if anything, mm. um, and had to had to make sure that it wasn't always about progress. Um, this is probably about ten years ago. Um, wasn't always about progress. That actually, there's a real gift in being able to stand still and enjoy sort of the beauty of now um and i think whilst i've probably never articulated as well as you just did it's i think that's very true i'm i naturally i'm a, like i said i said i'm naturally action right i'm naturally mm. do move forward always you know wanting to progress and be better or whatever um naturally but I have definitely learned to be much more present in the moment. And that took, I'd say, probably six, seven, maybe as far as 10 years ago. Um, that was, you know, it was a definite huge mindset shift. And, and in 2000, and I said it must have been 2014, 15 when I did that pie chart. So it's 2016. I, for that very reason, took my kids out of school and went traveling around the world. And actually mm. we ended up going for three years. Wow. And a big part of that was I wanted to wean myself off adrenaline. And it sounds, it's almost sad really that I didn't feel I could do it in this world, mm. that, you know, that I currently live in. Almost like the junk, as an adrenaline junkie, it's everywhere. So leaving the country... I mean, it took almost six months 
for it to properly leave my system. And I can't tell you how beautiful my mind was. I, it's, it was extraordinary. I have never, I've never experienced a, a period of time, or probably two and a half years, I mean, until I came back here, actually. Um, and I, I get moments of it now when I go out in nature. I know how to get back to it. You would probably, mm. I don't meditate, but I think that's how people probably get to it with meditation. I go into nature and put my feet on earth um, rather than the concrete jungle that we live in. But so I can now get back to it because I spent so long in that place. But for two and a half years, it was such a joy in my head. I mean, it was amazing. And that was, interestingly enough, all about being present. And it was all about being in the moment and not thinking about the future. Just saying, yeah. I'm done. That's and it. I wonder, yeah. I, it. But what was interesting is, I do have read uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy's book, uh, Be Your Future Self Now, which talks about the ability to picture who you want to be in your future and then be that person now. You know, so if you're picturing being, you know, less uh, adrenaline filled and you being more present and being more still and calm, that's a wonderful goal. And it's not something to aim for because we could actually begin to experience more of that now. And it's, that's what I was just hearing. It was just that, that I think you have to such a wonderful natural ability to project. And then what you've learned from experience is to manifest that into your reality right now. Yeah. I mean, I've never, I've never thought of it in that, in, in, in that respect, but I've definitely, I've, I mean, without a doubt, I've always been driven by my life, you know, like, what do I want my life to be like? And then everything else falls in, has to fall into place. I have to, all the moving pieces have to fall into what do I want my life to So even the decision to go traveling around the world took almost two years to basically make myself redundant from mm. my life. You know, that's, you, yeah. you don't just do that overnight. Yeah. That was big, big, big decision. And I walked away obviously from a lot here. I left the country as Dragon's Den hit um, and didn't come back, you know, for almost three <laughs> years. And very, very consciously didn't pursue that celebrity strictly mm. media path very very consciously having but only because a few years before I'd sat and asked myself why I was doing it and realized that the reasons weren't they weren't it wasn't enough for me it wasn't substantial mm. enough it wasn't important enough um and I think that helped me to say this is more important this is, I need to bottle time now with my kids at this age um, in a period that I'll never forget and will probably always be the best years of my life, actually. Um, if you can say that, I mean, yeah. they're all great, but you know what I mean? It's probably um, trying to bottle it much more important than that sort of adrenaline filled, I guess, ego filled really, if we're being honest with ourselves um, yeah. path, which is a different path. We're coming to the end of our interview. It's been incredible. I could talk to you all afternoon, as you know. Uh, but I do have one quick question for you. I think yes, just to, it's a question I did have written down. I, I, not that I, as I said to you, I, I never really ask the questions I write down. I, don't know. I always get them just, just in case. <laughs> um, but a lot of businesses seem to fail. I say that 60% of businesses seem to fail within three years of um, starting out. In a nutshell, why do you think most businesses don't seem to make it beyond that three years? What would your advice hmm. be to anyone who's just starting out thinking, right, okay, how can I avoid the three-year trap? It's a very, very difficult question to answer because it's it's obviously yeah. so many different reasons. So I think, firstly let's talk a little bit about that fluidity that we talked about mm. earlier in, in, in life. And, you know, that we talked about it sort of managing time, definitely in, a, in the context of a business, that's really important. And uh, whilst we can have an idea of what we think, you know, what does great look like? And it's important to always start with that question. What does great look like? What does success look like here? So you at least know what you're trying to get to. 
um, understand that there's probably a thousand paths to get you there. And in mm. fact, you might not end up there. You might end up over here. So be open to finding a business model within the business model that you start out with often. Um, I think that's really, really important. And to be honest with yourself um, as you you go through the, the the cycle of the business. One thing that is so difficult is to re- retain perspective as you run a business, very difficult. And that, especially if you don't have somebody around you that helps to sort of pull your head out of it. I mean, I'm I, this movement, I'm constantly <laughs> saying it to my team. It's like, my job is to pull them out of their, the, you know, the day-to-day running of the business to take them back to see the overview of the business yeah. and very, very difficult to do if there's just you and you're there with your little jetpack on your back and you're just self-propelling around, uh, but you're like in the detail. One day you're doing a presentation, the next day you're cleaning the toilets. You know, it's you're 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 in the whole thing with your calculator and doing your little. Uh, you could you could be doing your books. You're doing the whole thing. Very difficult to retain perspective, but very, very, very important. And whatever that might be, whether that is talking to somebody on a regular basis or, you know, every single idea I've ever come up with for a business has been on week three of a holiday. So that says something about adrenaline as well and the clarity of your mind as you allow yourself to properly relax and properly switch off. I can't stress enough how important that is whilst before you start a business, but whilst you're running a business, because if you lose that perspective, you, you absolutely cannot see where you're going. You know, you're just Mm. in the business and all you can see is what's happening in the mechanics of the business and you don't step back enough. So, you know, depending on who you are or what type of person you are, you might need that on a regular basis, like talk to somebody or you might find um, you're better off that you you need to you need to go away and you know I go on boot camps as you know and yeah, yeah. retreats and go on my own and sometimes I might just go for three or four days but it's enough now for me to empty my head and I go on long walks in the countryside on my own to empty my head and that's what I talk about is emptying my head I'm trying to empty mm. it all the time so that I have space to be able to retain perspective of not just my business, but actually life in general, but to retain some kind of perspective. I think that's critical. Um, Numbers, it sounds like such a boring answer, but numbers are, you've got to understand the, the overall business model within which you are work with, with which you are working with. You have to understand it. You know, what is it? Do you have a sustainable, replicable business model? Because if you don't, you don't really have a business. You have to get to the point where this is replicable and sustainable, i.e. financially sustainable, because actually there are loads of businesses that I've invested in and you know, that I've seen over the years that are not profitable for the first few, year, few years. It's okay if that's the model, you know, if that's yeah. what you've agreed to, that's the model, you see a way out and you've, you've written the path and you know what the, you know, you know, you know what it looks like at the end. That's all, that's okay. It's completely fine. But it's understanding that, that replicability of what it is that you've created that allows you to progress and have growth within a business because standing still is mm. very, very difficult place for a business because you'll always get newcomers in that will take over. So you need to progress, you need to change, you need to grow. Um, so I think that being on top of your numbers and understanding where where your profit comes from, you know, are you really making money here from the fundamental business that you're doing? And how do you replicate that? How do you grow? Um, is critical and I I can't stress that enough like how important it is to be all over your numbers all over them such good advice think of something else I've got anything but I think this is great advice anyone listening to this I hope they've been inspired by our, our conversation and your work and your mindset especially I think that um you know that almost like so what you know just go through your whys you know look through all the sort of blocks as to you know 
uh, what's preventing you and what's driving you. I think it's such a powerful conversation. Sarah, thank you so much for coming onto the Mindset Change podcast, which by the way, if anyone's listening to this, Sarah was fundamental in the podcast name. <laughs> Maybe people don't know this, but I had a lovely walk with Sarah when I was moving, uh, changing the name over and it was Sarah that I sought help with. I remember that walk <laughs> at the seafront. Uh, and Me too. Yeah, and it, your advice was absolutely invaluable. So I just wanted to say, actually, uh, thank you, because Mindset Change is now a top 1% global podcast. It's doing very, very, very well. Um, and, you know, yeah, your, your advice was very helpful in that. It's amazing. I mean, huge congratulations on. Oh, thank you. I mean, that what when what was that? Two, three years ago? Three yeah, years yeah, ago, yeah. maybe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's amazing how, how well you. It's it's really incredible. I've loved, yeah. loved, loved watching your your progress and your growth. And oh, thank, thank you. you so much for having me on. Oh, thank thank you. you so much. So, for listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, please do check out uh, Sarah Willingham's um, Instagram. It's very inspiring. Also, her website, sarahwillingham.com. And uh, I look forward to connecting with you all in the next episode.